Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello. Hi, it works. My name is Glenda, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Waukipaw 15 in Las Vegas. Waukipaw is the Western Area Conference of Young People in Alcoholics Anonymous. Please help me open this meeting with the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. The topic of this panel meeting is happy, joyous, and gay. And I have now asked Monica to read a passage from AA literature related to this topic. Okay, this is from page 52. Um, We had to ask ourselves why we should apply to our human problems the same readiness to change our point of view. We were having trouble with personal relationships. We, could con- we couldn't control our emotional natures. We were a prey of- to misery and depression. We, could make- we couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We could see. We couldn't seem to be, real- to be a real help to others, to other people. It was not a basic solution of these bedevilment more important than whatever we should see newsreels of lunar flight. Of course it was. When we saw others solve their problems by a simple reliance upon the spirit of the universe, we had to stop doubting the power of God. Our ideas did not work, but God's idea did. Thank you, Monica. It was beautiful. Now I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Christy P. from Las Vegas, Nevada. Hi, my name is Christy, and I am an alcoholic. I've never done this before, and on the way over here I was wondering what I could say um, that would be relevant to the topic, happy, joyous, and gay. <laughs> um, but actually the topic is alcoholism, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what it's like to be a gay alcoholic. Um, back when uh, when I first discovered that there were other gay people besides me, the only place you could go to meet other homosexuals was the bar. And I started going into gay bars from the time I was 15 years old. My first phony ID was inoculation papers from East Africa. They got me in everywhere, okay, because nobody knew, what the hell is that? So um, alcohol became a part of my life from that point on. I mean, everybody in the bar was drinking, and drinking was a part of the mating ritual. You know what I mean? When you walked up to somebody and you introduced yourself, or they walked up to you and introduced themselves, what's the first thing that come out of their mouth? Can I buy you a drink? So... Being predestined for alcoholism and homosexuality, they kind of went hand in hand. Also wanted to talk a little bit about rigorous honesty being a part of this program, because I don't know about you, but I knew I was gay from a really, really young age. I knew I was gay from the time I was five years old, because I fell in love with my best friend, and we were always talking about getting married. And that mindset of being with a female never wavered. Never changed. So as far as I'm concerned, I was born homosexual. So I started to learn how to lie from a really young age. Through junior high, I wasn't telling people I was gay. So lying, like drinking, became just a part of who I was. Um, I was very fortunate to come out at an early age because I was outed. I wrote down the words to a love song, gave it to my girlfriend when I was 14, and her mother found it. So her mother came to my house and and told my grandmother, who I lived with, "Uh, your granddaughter is sleeping with my daughter. Um, 
that was how <laughs> that was how my family discovered I was gay. So um, lying has always been a part of my life. Downplaying who I really am has always been a part of my life. So lying about my alcoholism was just a natural progression. Um, I'm 52 years old, and I've been trying to get sober for 30 years. I went to my first um, AA meeting in the early 80s, and I have 11 months. So I've been to five rehabs, long-term and short-term. Um, I've been in rehabs where I was able to admit that I was gay, and I've been in rehabs where I had to lie and say that I wasn't in order to be there. I never, ever, ever put the two together and said that being homosexual and growing up in the bars contributed to my alcoholism. I never made that connection, and I know that sounds ridiculous, but it never occurred to me that the lifestyle that I chose and the time frame that I came up really accentuated alcoholism. Everybody I knew was an alcoholic because everybody I knew hung out in the bars. Don't see any of the people that I came up with in Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know if this has happened to you, but I knew all these alcoholics and dope fiends, and I don't ever see any of them at meetings. I don't understand why everybody else isn't trying to get sober like, you know, like I've always trying to get sober. If we had cancer and someone said, you know, go to these meetings and do these steps and have a person that you can call 24-7 and you'll not have cancer anymore, I think the rooms would be full. But being an alcoholic and knowing so many people for so long and not seeing any of them at meetings just absolutely blows my mind. I don't know why I never stopped trying, but I do have 11 months. That's the longest I've ever been sober. Um, and what's different this time is I'm actually doing what, what I'm being told to do. You know, all the other times for 30 years I visited Alcoholics Anonymous. It was something to do when I wanted to, like, recover from my bottom and get my health back. You know what I mean? I would visit AA. I would visit NA because I am a crystal meth-smoking freak. You know what I mean? So anytime, anytime I wanted to, like, recover from my bottom, because I can recover from a bottom really easy. You know, I'm employable. I can get a job. I can get my health back. But recovering from a bottom is all I ever sought. I didn't really seek sobriety. I didn't really seek a psychic change. I didn't really seek to change everything about me so that I could stay sober. I have to be honest with you, for 30 years, that was never my goal. I just wanted to get out of whatever that present, current situation was. So I would visit Alcoholics Anonymous. This time is different. This time I have a sponsor. This time I'm working the steps. This time I'm in service. I have three service commitments that I am pretty faithful about, you know, um, sticking to my responsibilities and, and keeping my word. I'm starting to learn what it means to be a friend. And I'm starting to learn what it means to care. I learned, realized getting sober this time is that I don't know the first fucking thing about caring about anybody else. And if you would have told me that 10 years ago, I'd have laughed in your face. Because I've had partners. I've had long-term relationships. I thought I knew about love. I don't know anything about love. Because the only thing I ever loved was getting high and drinking. That's the only thing I ever really cared about. So in Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm learning how to care about other people. How to be a friend. You know, how to show up, answer the phone and think about somebody else instead of myself. Hey, better late than never. You know, I'm 52, and I should know these things already, but I don't, and so I'm learning. Um, love is not something I ever was successful at, but do you think that I ever thought it had anything to do with being an alcoholic? <laughs> no. <laughs> I always thought it was the person or the situation or the really not gay or whatever, but was it the fact that I was, you know, smoking crack and crystal in the bathroom? No, that had nothing to do with it. Um, I know that most of the time I'm afraid. 
like I said, I got 11 months of sobriety, and sometimes I wake up and I am like just shaking scared. Um, and a lot of times I don't know what it is I'm afraid of. I mean, I've always known how to get sober, but I have never, ever, ever stayed sober. So every day is like frightening to me. But I have a whole lot of people that I can call and a whole lot of people that will call me. And for right now, that's good enough. You know, I don't know what tomorrow will bring, but for right now, being sober is better than being in that bathroom talking to a hallucination that walked in and sat down on the toilet. You know, I used to have some really, really intense spiritual experiences when I was high. Really. And, you know, I gave away my vehicle to my dope dealer, signed my title over, thought it was a really good idea at the time. You know, I thought I was, I was taking a dangerous person off the road and I was, I was being, you know, generous to society. Um, needless to say, when I woke up, they were gone and so was the vehicle. But, um, now my spiritual experiences are nothing, nothing like that. My spiritual experiences are like, damn, I can't believe I didn't get high today. <laughs> That's a spiritual experience. I can't believe that I didn't get drunk today. That's a spiritual experience. They're not the type that come in and sit down on the couch and, you know, talk to me like they used to be after I'd been up a few days. Um, do I miss it? Yeah, I miss it. Because I'm the kind of alcoholic and drug addict that just, you know, had those all-out insane experiences and loved them. I used to get high and get pissed if I didn't have a hallucination. You know, that's what I was seeking. I thought it was another dimension of reality, and I was searching. I was an explorer. Now, that's the bullshit I told myself. So do I miss the intensity of living that kind of a lifestyle? Sane it is. And how I realize that it absolutely destroys my life. Then I don't miss it so much. So I'm glad to be here. Um, thank you for listening. And my name is Christy, and I am an alcoholic. Thank you, Christy. Um, now I would like to welcome our next speaker, Craig J. from San Diego. Hello, everybody. My name is Craig Johnson. I'm a recovered alcoholic. And I'd like to say I'm nervous as hell right now, so I'll get that out the way. Um, happy, joyous, and gay. Wow. I was trying to ask God this when I was in the, in the bathroom earlier. It's like I just, just, if I can reach one person today, that's basically all I, I ask of God. But, you know, I can only remember, like, when I first found out I was gay and I started realizing I was gay, you know, um, I thought I had to get drunk to get, be gay because I didn't know to go to the clubs and, and be, you know, and, and to do the uh, crack cocaine and, do all that stuff, and I even tried prostitution and all that stuff, and and I thought that would bring me some kind of happiness and everything else. Because the thing is, I was I was so afraid of myself. I was so afraid of how people were going to look at me and have a projection of me, and then that made me uncomfortable with my own skin. And by doing so, you know, I tried to do different things out there. I tried to like, as I was trying to do like churches. I thought if I can go out there and and, and I, I was with one. It was called. Um, I can't remember the name of it. Victory Outreach. I remember trying to go to Victory Outreach. And I remember come, going to Arizona. We uh, we went to this you know, on the crusade and everything else. I was, I'm going to bring people to Jesus and everything else, you know. But still having that fear inside of me because I know that I was gay and I thought I was hiding something from them and everything else. And I came back and everything from that retreat and everything and and I and and I left. And once I left there, you know, that retreat and everything. I remember like getting wanting to get drunk and get high because I still had that, that 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 secret I was holding inside of me. You know, I was gay and everything else. And I tried all kind of different things. I tried another church group. I tried all um, all kind of different things to to try to change who I was because I didn't you know because I was never happy with me. I didn't like me. You know, um, I've had relationships. Well, my longest relationship was with a woman. Um, I was in high school, um, I was a junior, she was a senior, we were together for seven years, um, and then 
and I knew I was, and I knew I was gay at that time, but I didn't, I wasn't willing to admit it. You know, she had a miscarriage by me and everything else. And, and, uh, the reason why I knew I was gay at that time was I remember going over to her house for a family dinner because so her mom loved me and everything else. I remember this when I was eating dinner. Her brother would always come to the table and eat dinner with us. And I, instead of me checking, checking her out, like, you know, I go, go out for her. I was looking at her brother like, damn, you are fine. <laughs> but, um, but still, yet I was still trying to like, oh yeah, I'm straight guy, yeah, yeah. But you know what the thing is, is like, I remember trying to come into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and everything else, and I came in, I got like a year and a half to, um, dry. The reason why I say dry, because I wasn't willing to work the steps, I wasn't willing to be honest with myself. I remember people are talking, talking about the how, being honest, open-minded, and willingness. And when I looked at being, being that, it's like, Honest, I'd be honest with myself, who I am. I admit my animal self and I'm an alcoholic. And people told me that once I can do that, I was on the way and been open-minded. You know, I'd be allowing myself to be teachable to new things. Once I can allow myself to be teachable to new things, then I could be willing to do the necessary work for myself today. And that's, that's what happened with me, because I was going in and out, in and out. And I thank God for the sponsor that I had. Um, at that time, because he got tired of my black ass. He said, look, I'm a, he set me down. He said, you know what? You've been going in and out, in and out, and all this stuff. You've been giving me the same sad ass excuses all over the time. He says, if you want this program, you got to be willing to do what it takes and everything else. And I got home as being the typical alcoholic that I am. I went home. I was, had a resentment. I said, fuck him. I got some whatever it calls on my bullshit. And, and um, the thing is, I got home. I thought about what he said and everything else. And I said, you know what, it's true. If I really want this program, I gotta be willing to do what it takes for myself. And, and by doing so, the first three steps, you know, really brought me home. You know, and this is, we admitted we were probably this over alcohol. And I, you know, I started thinking, I was like, you know what, all this stuff that I was doing, going, trying to get drunk and prostituting and all these different things. And I, I remember that I couldn't just have 140 ounces of Old English 800. I had to have four or five bottles of the ounces of Old English 800. Then if I had drunk some, if I drank anything, if I was drinking like Captain Morgan's or anything else, I couldn't have one fifth. I tried to have two fifths, you know. And, and then the, insane, the whole insanity about it is like, well, if the, if the stores closed at two o'clock in the morning, I was so resentful because I was thinking like I had to have that. What was I going to do from four o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning to six o'clock when they opened the, the, the things up? You know what I mean? I had that going on, but the thing is. And once I was willing to admit I was an alcoholic and my life was unmanageable, and because by then it was I was unmanageable because I was looking at all the things I just mentioned, um, prostituting myself and you know being homeless. I didn't say I was homeless because I was homeless out there. And the second step, you know, have power greater than myself to restore me to sanity because I realized that you know all that stuff that I was doing was insane. A normal person wouldn't try to prostitute themselves. A normal person wouldn't be. Trying to like stand in front of a liquor store at 5:55 uh, a.m. You know, just waiting for them to turn that key just to get some drink. You know, and once I did that, and uh, and, and having a power greater than myself, which is I choose to call God because I love God today. And, you know, this is what you guys have given me. You guys have given me a God. You know, and that's in that third step. You know, you know, um, I came. You know, and I had to allow myself to be in God's will instead of my will, as I understand Him. And, and that, and that right there brought me home, you know, is I mean, you guys told me I can have a God of my own understanding, cause I, the God that I have was the kind of God that was condemning. He said, you're gonna, you gotta repent, you gotta be saved, you gotta go in here. But once you guys told me, oh, you can come in, come in, I'll call it Son of a Son of a God that you love, and stay, I have a God who loves me, who cares about me, who wants the best for me, despite my own best thinking. My own best thinking, and you know, I gotta, I tell my sponsees, I said, I'm like, I have the kind of disease that does not want me happy. I had the kind of disease that's going to try to set me up for any people, places, I think, that set me up for that resentment. And I was taught earlier on, once I got on this in the program, that um, a resentment is something I can't hold on to. You know, that if I hold on to that resentment, I'll go out there and drink again. And once I worked the 12 steps and everything, and I love that that 12 step, it says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry the message to the alcoholic and practice these principles in all my affairs. And that right there is, is just like the icing on the cake for me, you know what I mean? Because I, I had to work the 11 prior steps to get this spiritual awakening and be honest with myself and everything else. And the greatest thing that brings me joy um, today um, is is carrying the message to another alcoholic. You know, I, 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 I kind of classify myself as a newcomer whore 
if I see a newcomer out there, you know, I'm like, I want to reach them in, like, yeah, you're home, you know, you know, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. Because today, I, you know, I sponsor some guys, you know, it's amazing because all my sponsees are straight. One is in Afghanistan right now. Uh, the one, you know, he's about to get out the Navy and, and the one, he has just picked him up. I just gave him his one year medallion. And to me, that's, 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 that's the beauty and the joy of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not about who I am as a person. You know, it's allowed me to have a certain door of wherever I may go, I can be who I am as a person. You know, you know, I, you know, I, cause like, I couldn't do that before when I was, when I was doing what I was doing. Cause like, I had a certain fears like, you're going to know who I am. And once you know who I am, you're not going to like me. You're going to reject me. Cause that was my whole MO my whole life. I feel, I feel, um, abandoned. I feel rejected. I felt all these things. But when I came into a room, it's a lot of hearts knowing that you guys love me. You guys took care of me. You guys said, you know what? We don't give a F if you're gay. Are you an alcoholic? And I said, yes, that's all that counts. It's just one alcoholic related to another alcoholic. And, you know, the greatest things is the joys and the things that makes me happy today because I get today I have, I have a good relationship with my mom, you know, and everything else. And, and she lives in um, Arizona. You know, these are the great gifts. You know, once you come in and everything else, you can be honest with yourself and everything and those people around you. You know, because I, I truly believe this is a program of attraction rather than promotion. I can't go out there and promote, yeah, I'm, al- I'm, a, I'm, I'm an alcoholic, I'm, I'm gay, love me, accept me. You know, I, they have to see the change in me. Once people can see the change in me and everything else, and, they, and, and, they, and, and I can invite them into my life today. And, and you know, because like in my MO, I just lies and lies my ass off. You know, I gave people all kind of promissory notes, and once they try to cash them in, they bounced. You know, today is like, you know, I like that attraction part because, you know, once they can see I'm honestly trying to change my life with, with a higher power and everything and the 12 steps around me, then there's hope, you know, and everything else. And I, you know, I love, it's, it's just happy, I mean, here's a happy, joyous, and gay. You know, you know what? I love it, you know, because today, you know, um, wow, happy. Today, you know, the thing that brings me, um, Coming to things like this, you know, what I'm saying, uh, and we're going into the rooms of AA. I don't really do go to a lot of gay meetings, and I don't really want to, you know. Maybe I should, but I really don't because because the reason why because that 12 service is practice these principles and all my affairs, and I like to go to I like to go to um, quote unquote straight meetings, regular meetings, you know, because I because 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 this is only requirement for AA membership is desire to stop drinking. If I can sit there and we can just identify as ourselves, myself as just wanting to stay sober, you know, just want to have a common bond in that area of my life, and, that, and then that, that's cool with me, you know. And, that, and I don't know what else to say, but I love Alcoholics Anonymous with all my heart because without Alcoholics Anonymous, I know where I would be. I know I'll be out there trying to ask somebody for a fit, be panhandling, trying to get. Trying to get another 40 ounce, I'd be trying to knock on somebody's door, crack through this door at 12 o'clock at night. Hey man, can I get you guys some crack cocaine for me? You know, today that's the freedom I have today. I don't have to do those things today. And I you know you guys, old timers told me it's a choice. You know, and that, and that's the greatest thing is like, if you want this thing, you can have it. If you don't, you know, that's the choice. I can't blame anything else around me because I used to blame people for everything in my life. You know, and everything else. And once I did that fourth step and my fifth step with my sponsor, that right there told me that the blame game is no longer there. I got to look at myself and what I'm doing today and everything else. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, I just love this thing, you know. Um, I don't know. I, I, like, I tell my sponsors, I tell them, I say, no, I look at my old life as like my vomit. You know, why would I want to go back to that vomit when I know the, such, to the freedom that I have today? You know, and I, I, I truly believe that, you know, because how I work my program, I have God, Alcoholics Anonymous, in me. I always tell my sponsees and everything else, and I gotta be everything I tell them. I gotta be, I gotta be able to practice it for myself. If not, I'm just doing it as zip service. I tell them, I say, God, Alcoholics Anonymous did not bring me this far, and say, hey, Craig Johnson, you, you know what? I mean, you know, I brought you this far, but it's gonna let you be like, a, you know, see if you can fend for yourself and do it on your own. Now, no, that's not the case for me, you know. God and Alcoholics Anonymous brought me this far, and then things get complicated because I, you know, because I like to complicate the hell out of things for a simple solution. But you know, the, you know, 
you guys taught me is like, you know, if you just trust in your higher power and trust in the program, you know, to carry me the rest of the way. And I truly believe that's daily, you know. Um, whoever has, and here is new, I really welcome you to AA because you know what? Without Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm nothing. And I truly believe that today. I am nothing without this program because this program is giving me everything. It's, it's taught me how to be responsible. You know, I've been at the, you know, I've been at the same job now for 17 years, you know, and that right there is, I mean, I may not be happy with that job, but the thing is, you know, you guys taught me to be responsible, how to pay my bills and how to pay them on time and do all these different things and how to be a productive member of society instead of quit, quit trying to take from society, the little I'm going to give to society. And all these things that really, ha that really brings me joy because the only thing I wanted to do when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous was grow up. I sat here a 46-year-old man with, with, with 14 years of recovery, and I don't say that to brag, because, you know, the thing is, my old-timers told me, don't have too many years, not enough days. And, and uh, the most important thing is I'm standing here in front of you guys, and then you guys know how much I love my college anonymous. And whoever's new here, you know, just learn how to give yourself a break, because that's what I was told earlier on, just give yourself a break. You know, I have to realize that I'm right where I need to be right now in my recovery. You know, and that brings me joy because once I can do that, I'm allowing myself to keep, uh, allowing myself to continue to be open-minded, you know, and be willing to do the things I can do. And if I can continue, continue to be open-minded and everything else, I can be happy with my life. I can, can, I can continue to continue to experience the joys of, of life today. I can go anywhere I want, do the things like I mentioned before. Um, I don't know what else to say because I, t I was told earlier on in my recovery, if you if you talk too much, then you're starting to lie. So I don't want to lie to you guys because then I, then I won't be honest. But thank you guys so much for my recovery and have a good walk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Craig. And finally, please help me to welcome our last speaker, Debbie O from Las Vegas, Nevada. I'd like to thank the Academy for this award. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that. Um, my name is Debbie, and um, I drink too much, I smoke too much, I find out that I talk too much. I'm a liar, I'm a cheat, I'm a thief. I'm a lesbian, and I'm an alcoholic. And, you know, and I remember people saying, you know, when, when you first come into the rooms, I, people would say, God, I just never felt like I fit in. And I'm a lesbian. I never, and I honestly believe like an alcoholic, I was born a lesbian. I remember being like around four years old and my mom had a friend and she, and her friend had a little boy and a little girl. And my mom says, I want you to meet little Mikey. And I thought, fuck little Mikey. I want to meet little Susie. <laughs> Straight out the gate. There was, and my... <laughs> I was very different, and, and I don't think it's because of my ism. I just think it was because of everything. I am, um, my father, my mother, my mother was Mexican. She didn't speak any English until she was nine, so I'm half Mexican, and I say the half I sit on. And my father was German and Irish. He had blue, blue eyes and a little butt. Guess what side I got? And they had five kids. My father was in the Navy. He had a child in every port. I was in the port of Hawaii, so I'm considered a Kanaki, which means I'm Ho I, it's, I'm not Hawaiian, but there's a name for it. I was born in Hawaii, but I'm not Hawaiian. And my mother loved us, and she loved us so much. I mean, you can actually love someone where it strangles them, and she just totally strangled. We used to go to the doctors, and there was five of us, and, my, and the doctor would say, well, what's wrong? And my mom would say, this is what's wrong with her. This is what's wrong with him. This is what's wrong. She just spoke for all of us. I have an older brother who up until the age of like 33, she would actually get in his car and go to like AMPM and she would go and say, I want $5 in pump number five. He couldn't even do that because my parents did everything. My mom did everything for us. She used to tell my dad, you do not come first. My kids come first. You come second. She loved us. She smothered us. I was the one that I could tell you I wanted $5 on pump number four. I can tell you what was wrong with me. I also knew that at a very young age that if you hold the lie up against the truth, what hurts the most is the truth. Because it's like a, you know, it's like a, a bullet. You know, that I can tell you a lie. I don't care who you tell. You can't hurt me because a lie is a lie. But if I tell you the truth, oh, that's ammo. 
I have an older brother who um, is, he was the one everyone wanted his son like. He was going to become a priest. He was very well-mannered, very well-educated, but he was also the boogeyman in the family. And he said, did some things to me that that brothers shouldn't do that are sisters or anybody should do it to anybody. And that's honestly not why I'm a lesbian. And that's not why I'm an alcoholic. That's just life happened. That's just life. And um, and I remember my brother telling me to not tell anybody that they wouldn't believe you. And I was young. I was like six. And I remember believing him. I knew it. I don't know why, but I just did. Lying, I I love lying. Whoever invented lying, I'd sleep with them. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. It's lazy. But you know what? Here's the thing is I lied so much because I wasn't, I didn't want you to, you weren't going to hurt me. I lied so much where I didn't know where the truth started and the lie began. I honestly really didn't. I remember I was in junior high and I didn't do well in school. I was always this fat little dyke, right? And um, I think the only thing that I did well in was nutrition and lunch. I excelled it in those classes. And we had, um, in math. I did really well in math. I like numbers. And we were taking a test. And um, my neighbor, who actually really was my neighbor at the house, he said, Debbie, let me look at your paper. And I said, what? And the teacher said, Miss Omen, bring up your paper. So I brought up my paper, and she puts an F on it, and she says, now take this home to your parents and have them sign it. So I don't have any parents. They're both dead. Just like that. Just... Really? I said, yeah, I live with my grandmother. She's very old, and she can't write. She erased the F. She gave it back to me. I went back, finished my tape, my paper. Now, my parents, being really good parents, went to every open house that we had. I remember the night before, we had to put down every classroom, and I'm like, ah, I left that classroom out. That was my first original prayer that I ever remember praying. God, please don't let him find that class. Please don't let him find that class. I go to school the next day. That teacher says, God, we've got, we had a wonderful turnout. Everybody came. People from the dead came, she said. <laughs> Everybody came. I don't remember getting in trouble. My mother loved me. She wanted to protect me. Never remember getting in trouble. I went to high school and I got the job as taking money from, um, from the, the teachers in the cafeteria. And um, and every day I would take five bucks. Every day was the last day. I'm gonna take five. this time. I'm gonna take twenty. So I was in homeroom one time, and my friend. And what I would do is I would just take the money, and and me and my friend Vicky, we would go get some beers and we'd get some burritos. Because I really I grew up in the San Fernando Valley in Southern California. We went from Hawaii, lived there for about five years, and then I went to so Southern California is home. And um, my friend Vicky, who I so graciously ser- shared burritos and um, Mickey's with she comes and she comes to my homeroom she's like they're looking for you i'm like what are you talking about she's like the cops are here they're looking for you all of a sudden we're stupid i I didn't do anything (laughs) why are they looking for me i've been still in for like the last you know five months so they cops came to my homeroom and they cuffed me and i had to walk through the high school and i get to the principal's office and my mom is sitting there and the principal and they said she's been taking money you know, we set her up. We told, you know, none of the teachers to put a 20. We only had one 20 there, and that was the day. It was my last day, and I was only going to take a 20. And um, and I'm I'm scared. And as sure as I'm standing here, my mother looks at the principal and says, her father's not working. She was bringing that money home to me. And I'm crying now. I'm like, yeah, now we're not going to have anything to eat. You're ruining everything. Sure enough. <laughs> Because she wanted to protect me. She wanted to save me. I love drinking. I'm a drunk. I love everything about drinking. I love the bars. I love how the bars are dark. I love how the glass of bottles behind the mirror look. I love how the ice tingles against the glass. I love the word cocktail. I think it's a good cocktail, no matter how you say it. Pastors, cocktail, cocktail. It's a beautiful word. I love that everybody in there is shady and they're all about trying to who's going to fuck who first. And not like literally, you know what I'm saying? I love everything about alcohol. Here's the thing is, I'm funny. I've got a great personality. I really do. 
And I've always been this fat, unattractive kid. I was never, I didn't look like a girl. I was never interested in makeup. I was interested in the girls who wore makeup. But I just, you know, if I were to honestly try to dress like whatever a girl is supposed to dress like, I would look absolutely ridiculous. So what I had going for it was my humor. I didn't make you laugh. But see, when I got drunk, I didn't care about making you laugh. I didn't care. That was my hoe out. I didn't care with the fact of the, of the matter that that um, the things that happened to me with my brother, and I always swore that, I always swore that everything, whatever happened, it was never going to affect any part of my life. And what it ended up doing was affecting every part of my life. Because of the fact that I used to have girlfriends, I, oh God, I had girlfriends that I would tell them that my father would physically abuse me. And what happened was my brother would sexually abuse me. But through years of therapy, what I realized was that was me just screaming out. Screaming out that I, I want to be heard. I need, I just, I want to be loved. So what I'm doing is, is I'm not telling you the truth because the truth is, the truth is the truth. And that's ammo. But I'm screaming to you, so I'm telling you that I'm in pain. So what happened is when they would reciprocate, especially with women, we're nurturers by nature. And we'd want to comfort you. But I knew it was a lie and I didn't deserve it, so I pushed it away. So it was a constant this. I wanted to be loved. I wanted to be heard. That was it. But I couldn't tell you that God's honest truth. So all of my life, I did this pulling you, pushing you, pulling you. I want to scream to you. But I'm in pain. I couldn't. Because that gave you ammo. Drinking. Huge. I didn't care. If fat lesbian prostitution was a money maker back then, I would have done it. <laughs> I was driving down Sepulveda Boulevard, and I was lit. It was 4 in the morning, lit, and I had to pee, kind of like I have to do now. I don't know why. The moment she said my name, I have to pee. Anyways, and on Sepulveda Boulevard in, Los, in, in, in L.A., um, there's a bar, there's a strip joint, and the parking is right in front. You don't have to, like, go in the back. It was right in front. I'm like, great. So I pull over, and I have a VW, the really nice bug, and I go on the passenger side and I'm peeing. I'm lit. And I see a cop guy, a cop car go by. I see it come back. Now you can't rush pee. Pee is going to pee. You can't stop it. It's just, you're going to pee. And I'm peeing. And this cop comes up to you and he's like, what are you doing? And what does it look like I'm doing? There's a flood right here. I'm peeing. He says, what's your name? I said, it's Debbie Itapun Wit Wit Ya. He said, what? I said, it's Debbie Itapun Wit Wit Ya. He says, how do you spell that? I said, Y K, no, that's not it. K R, that's not it. It was. That was my name. And you spell it U A P O O N V I R I Y A. Because I married somebody for, for $10,000 to be in the country. Because I didn't care. Really, I just sold my soul. I did sell my soul. And you know what? I didn't get arrested. You know why? Because the keys were in my pocket. Never been incarcerated. Don't know why. We should have. I should have. You know? Don't know why. But here's what I know is that alcohol made me feel like I had a chance. I didn't care if I had a chance. It was all about... It was all about who could fuck who first. And it wasn't personal. If you fucked me before I fucked you, then good for you. Anything that you can, that came out of your mouth, there was no way it could be true. Because I don't know who I am. I'm going to tell you exactly what I think you need. I know what you want to hear. I know how you want me to say it. And alcohol relieved all of that. I was with some friends in, in Hollywood, and they had open mic. And somebody said, and I, it was like 2 in the morning. They said, you can do that, Debbie, doing some stand-up. I said, I can do that. Went up there, gave them about 10 minutes worth of gigs. People bought me drinks. I've been at the improv. I've been at the comedy store, all for alcohol. I actually got a paying gig at the Laugh Factory. I'd get there like around 2 in the morning, and if I made them laugh, then the next day I'd, I'd go on at 1 in the morning. If I made them laugh, then I'd come back the next day at midnight. Brilliant, because I made you laugh. I got down, and people wanted to buy me drinks. 
because they thought I'd entertain them during my drink, which never happened. I'd take my drink, thank you, and I'd go walk around, I'd start drinking, and I was done my, my drink, I'd come back to you, so how you like the show? They'd buy me another drink. I was at the comedy store, I had a gig at the comedy store. And in the comedy store, they had this one room, this small room, and a table about this long, and a pile of cocaine. And they thought, if the audience is this high, then you should be this high. And I'm like, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. And one day, and this is how long ago I was doing stand-up. I went to the main room, because I was never on the main room. I went to the main room, and there was Roseanne Barr and Louis Anderson on stage. And they were like, this is it. This is a year for us comedians. I was. I got on stage one time. I was so drunk. That this is, I, I think I started something like, I, I, and I knew who was drunk because they were the ones that got it. They're like, oh, that's hilarious. You know, and I dropped the microphone and I just thought I wasn't funny anymore. I never thought it was because of drugs or, or drinking. Never. I just honestly really thought I wasn't funny anymore. A friend of mine introduces me to um, Alcoholics Anonymous. I remember my first meeting and people sharing and and I'm like, and they're sharing from the heart, and they're crying. And I'm like looking around going, you guys buying this crap? Really? Are you going to honestly tell me that that's exactly what's going on with you, and you're telling people, oh, my God. they got pistols everywhere now. You're killing yourselves. I couldn't believe it. So stopped. I started getting sober for about two years. Didn't read the big book. Told my sponsor I don't know how to read. Which I'm dyslexic, but I know I can, I can read. But because, let me tell you something, it was easier to put down the drink and the drug than it was to stop lying, stealing, and cheating for me. Because that was all my safety gets. You know, I'll put you right here. I love you. I couldn't get you here. I couldn't. So I worked for a company and they um, were opening a plant in Vancouver, Washington, and they needed somebody to run it. And, and I said, that's me. Two years of sobriety, I knew I was going to drink. I wasn't working the steps. I was lying to my sponsor. Um, get to Vancouver, Washington. Actually, it was in Portland, Oregon. In Clackamas, Clackamas, Washington is where the plant was. They were trying to get the Canadian market. I get off the plane. I go to a meeting, and they say, are there any um, new residents? And I raise my hand, and I said, my name's Debbie. I'm an alcoholic. I just got off the plane, and I'm going to drink. Really? <laughs> no. And after the meeting, not one person came up to me and said, here's my number. Not one person came up to me and said, hey, there's a schedule. Take one. You're going to need one. Not one person. So I said, fuck you. I'll show you. Drank. Drank for like two and a half years in Vancouver, Washington, and Portland, Oregon. Let me tell you this. I had some bad luck in Vancouver, Washington, and Portland, Oregon. But here, here's the deal. Is when, I love when they say you can take the drink from the drunk, but you can't take the AA from the alcoholic. Because now I'm two years into my using and drinking, and I want to get the fuck out, and I can't. And I'm with these freaking hick people, and we're drinking, we're lit, and we're doing coke. And this like, kid, you not, I went like this. I have choices today. <laughs> And you guys are not healthy for me. So I'm going to take my Coke and my alcohol and I'm out of here. You can take the drink from the drunk, but you can't take the AA from the alcoholic. I struggled with that. I really honestly did. And I came to, um, I came to Las Vegas because my parents retired here and, um, I got sober. Here's the thing is that I'm the one that AA cleans me up. Dust my knees off, makes me look good, and then I get my will back. And I think, just I could just have one drink. Really, I think that. When they talk about it, it's cunning, baffling, and powerful. It honestly is. It's cunning because, you know, it has really different disguises. It's baffling because it has patience like you wouldn't believe. It'll wait. It'll wait. And it's powerful because we can't do this alone. I get that. I get that. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I used to do stand-up, and I didn't know what we had. I couldn't, there, I, I didn't even know what to say to you. To say I wasn't funny anymore, because I, I really didn't know it was about the drink and the drug. And I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous that you can have a lot of fun. You really honestly can. 
here's the thing is I've, I've done this time around. My sobriety date is August 4th, 2010. I tried to get this thing in 91. And I know that it doesn't matter to me. Because here's what I learned is I did a thorough first step and I've never done a thorough first step before. I actually with my sponsor went through the book and I saw how my drinking started where I was when I started progressing, went it to where it got really bad and where it was a necessity. I could not go another day without alcohol. And the moment that I realized it was almost like there's a black hole, literally. And if for no, there's no reason for me to take another drink of drug. If I were to drink one more time, I would just dive right into that hole to hell. I get that. I never got that before. I have a lot of people in Alcoholics Anonymous that we love to like, you know what, here's the thing. is, As I love this year, it's Rule 62. Don't take yourself too seriously. You can't. I love Alcoholics Anonymous because you can tell, you can come up here and talk some crazy stuff and people are laughing or they're nodding. Only in Alcoholics Anonymous can we, we let in, well, we don't let in, but what rapists and murderers come in and what do we tell them? We tell them keep coming back. Only in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because the things that we did are not who we are. I love that. Thank God it's a spiritual program. I remember somebody early on, they said, people go to church because they don't want to go to hell. People come to AA because they've been to hell. That makes sense to me. My God. I, when I was, when I was 19, I went, I was recovering Catholic. I went to, um, I went to confession, right? And the priest was, I think, like 118, because that's like the stipulation to become a Catholic priest, right? And I confessed that I was a lesbian. And he told me, you are not a child of God. You are not welcome in this house. And that's the house that I made my first Holy Communion. And I went to my mom, and I said, see, they're right. They told me, because I'm a lesbian, I'm going to hell. He said, nope. So then she took me back. We went to a higher priest, and he apologized. He said, no, you're a child of God. You're always a child of God. That whole religion, that whole God thing. That's, I'm the outcast. They don't want me. So here's the thing is that I've done a thorough first step. I ask my higher power every morning to put somebody in my life that I can be of service. And I try to be as honest to you as possible. I just try not to fuck you. I try not to steal from you. I try not to lie from you, lie to you. Try not to hurt you. That's it. It kind of gets real simple. And then you know what they talk about? You're going to have a world beyond your wildest dreams because you're going to have people in your life that you were never going to ever, you would have never had before. I was with some friends. I was with some, what's this for? Is this my timer? Oh, I'm pre-menopausal. I'm hot. Oh, sorry. What is it? If I don't sweat, I'll explode. Trust me. No, no, no. Da da da. Um, I was with some friends the other day and we we're all talking about losing their virginity. Yeah, that's what I said. And this, and they were straight women. They were straight women. And my, my one friend, Gail, she says, well, when I lost my virginity, I said, lose your virginity. How do you lose your virginity? You don't lose your, should I gave mine away? And she, and they were really serious. Like, no, when I lost my virginity, I said, really? I said, what happens to you, heterosexual? Are you like walking down the street one day and all of a sudden you're like, oh, stop, nobody move, nobody move. I swear it's got to be around here somewhere. No one move. We were in the car. Was it in the car? We're in the elevator. Could have been in the elevator. <laughs> really, people, we say and we do the stupidest things. Anyways, um... But here's the thing is that, um, especially with the fact that, that you guys are young. Oh my God. This is a good deal. To thy own self be true. So give yourself a chance. Um, the fellowship, the meetings are, the fellowships are in the meetings, but the program is in the steps. If you don't have a sponsor, you gotta get a sponsor. And if you have some time and you're not sponsoring somebody, you need to sponsor somebody. Because if you're not working a step, you're pretty much dead. But I just want to do this one last thing and then I'll stop because I was just having so much fun. Um, where is this? Does anybody have a pen? 
Whatever. Okay, great. Okay. Come here. I just need three people. Just, can, just three people. You want to, would you come up, please? Yeah, you. You want to come up, too? And you. Here. With this, I just want you to write really quick. This is fun. This is a game that, that's not a game, but you guys are going to want to, here, be careful with this pen. Here's what I want you to do, is I want you to write the chore, the chore. You hate the worst, but don't tell me what it is. Tell me why you hate it. Like, if you hate doing dish, washing dishes, you might say it's because it makes my hands um, wrinkly or I don't like it being wet. Do you get it? So you're going to write down, and then, can you let me have the pen? Write down the chore you hate the most, but don't tell me what the chore is. Tell, I know, see? Sorry. Tell me why you hate it. That's a long ass chore. You're still writing. Here, here's, do you need this pen? Okay, wait, hold, hold on to that. Yeah. Really, where you're not paying attention. <laughs> yeah, like, don't tell me what the chore is. Tell me why you don't like doing it. Don't, don't, this is gonna be fine, really. It's just, So this, no, I just said I was going to do some stand-up. No, this is great. Uh, you know, I got to thank Jackie, who wasn't able to be here, for asking me to speak, because she's awesome. I wish she was. You would have dug her story a lot better than mine. Are you done? Okay. All right, what is your name? Erica. Erica. Hold on to that, Erica. What is your name? Wayne. Wayne. Sure it is, Wayne. Oh, that's Wayne, everybody. And what's your name? Seamus. We're going to start with Seamus. Okay, the real question is, why do you not like sex? What would you read? Because he's lazy. Are you with somebody? Oh, do they know this? They probably do. <laughs> why don't you like sex? <laughs> oh, why don't you like sex? <laughs> no one likes a bragger. <laughs> Listen, here's the bottom line is you can have lots of fun in Alcoholics Anonymous. You really can, man. Just, you know what? Be real. Be honest. And um, thank you for letting me be here today. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.